It was a case you had to investigate to believe. I was screaming at the top of my lungs <laughs> and peeing at the top of my bladder. Murder was just the entree. Settle in for a four-course meal of sex, lies, and tiramisu. Love will make you do crazy things. They shot a priest. I've never seen a man last that long. You're not going to edit this out of context, are you? Completely naked and gasping for air. We may never know the truth. A quiet, unassuming residential street in the heart of Queensland's Gold Coast. No one would ever suspect it to be the setting of a grisly homicide. I always suspected that street would be the setting of a grisly homicide. I drive past it on my way to the precinct every morning and I remember thinking, that street's gonna be the setting of grisly homicide someday. And sure enough, call comes in and I'm like, <clears throat> someone died. On the evening of February 22nd, 2022, Deborah Ashell, a 42-year-old social media mum, is stabbed to death in her own bed. The only other people in the house are her husband Gilbert Ashell, a professor of poetry at the local university, and their two children, Lane and Millicent. The husband called it in around 9.45pm. Uh, he was very distraught. <laughs> distraught, distraught, yes, okay. Police, what is uh, your emergency? Uh, Hello? Uh, yeah, hi there. Uh, someone else has uh, killed my wife. Can you send whoever you need to send? Uh, number 166 Moresbury Road, Wondong. Appreciate it. So is your wife still breathing? Sir? Detectives Edith Spoink and Matthew Hogman are the seventh and eighth officers on the scene. Yeah, I missed the exit and the forensic boys beat us there by 40 minutes, but they just waited around outside. We were the first ones in the house, apart from the one guy who had to use the toilet. The sight that greets them is the stuff of nightmares. This is gorgeous. I could see myself here. Not on our salary. Gilbert Shell. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for coming on such short notice. My kids are in their rooms. I explained to them what happened. After searching the entire house front to back, the detectives find Deborah's body in the master bedroom, right where Gilbert Ashell told them it would be. Medical examiners will later conclude she died from heart failure after being stabbed in the abdomen 57 times. This was no accident. Or if it was, it was a big accident. From the get-go, we had multiple potential suspects. I liked the husband. Because of the blood? No, I mean, I liked him. He was a cool dude. Gilbert Ashell believes his wife is the victim of an unidentified intruder who crawled out of the canal and dried themselves off with a towel planted on the beach by an accomplice. The killer must have broken that window to get in. My, my kids and I didn't hear it because we were watching a movie in our home cinema. You have a home cinema? Yes, it's double soundproof. That's why we didn't hear that and the 9.2.6 Dolby Atmos setup. Isn't it true that the reason all of the glass is on the outside instead of the inside where it should be is because of you? Uh, Upon discovery of the broken window, you picked up each individual piece of glass and threw it outside for the safety of your children. Yes, I did do that. That's so astute of you. Do you have children of your own? Uh, <clears throat> no. Um, no time to start a family in this job. Actually, I found plenty of time, but my wife's never been in the mood. Uh, the name of the movie you were watching? The Fugitive. Harrison Ford? Oh, classic. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife! <laughs> she was. Of course he didn't. What kind of husband kills his wife? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. Yeah, and we'll of course find your fingerprints on each piece of broken glass. Oh, uh, no, I wore gloves. Smart. And the intruder probably wore gloves too. That's why there's no prints on the ledge or the frame. All right, I think we've covered the window. We should really check out the cinema. Detective Spoink accused me of getting too friendly with Gilbo, with Mr. Ashell. But no, we just had a lot in common, both in the sports, both in the movies, both our wives were massive impediments to our happiness. I loved my wife. Losing her was one of the most stressful experiences of my life. 
but Detectives Spoink and Hogman put me immediately at ease. I was relieved knowing officers of their caliber were on the case. <gasps> Look at this. Keller left a calling card. We can expect others. Pretty sure the forensics people put that there. Well, it was one or the other. Crown Prosecutor Diana Lynch remembers the case with solemn reverence. This case was a complete clusterfuck from screw up one. I'll let Spoink and Hogman provide you with all the details because nothing can do a better job demolishing their credibility than their own accounts. I'd call them an embarrassment to the uniform, but that would be an insult to the concept of embarrassment. Lynch was never our most fervent advocate. Why didn't she like us? A mystery to rival the pyramids. To hear her tell it, it all had to do with the fact that between the two of us, we'd bungled more cases than we'd closed, more cases than we'd even been assigned to. But you know, she's judging based on merit. What about diversity? Because I'm one quarter Dutch. Detecting has always been in my blood. I'm not sure how it got there. My parents were both circus clowns. Oh, Spoink's a born detective. In fact, I used to joke that she plopped out of her mother's uterus and immediately identified her father as the guy with the camcorder. <laughs> Dad! You know. My parents died giving birth to me. But yes, I am observant. I can always tell when something doesn't quite add up. I wasn't like the other kids at the orphanage. While they were playing with G.I. Joes and Barbie dolls, I was lying in wait. And once they'd finished playing, I'd take those dolls, dismember them and stage miniature crime scenes. I wasn't what you'd call a popular kid. I don't really know why I wanted to be a cop. I just remember thinking firefighter looked like too much climbing. But when I met Spoink at the academy, we really connected, mainly over our shared ostracism from the other cadets. They kept trying to get us to go in with them on something they called the take, but they got pretty pushy about it. We told them it didn't make sense. We're cops, how can we take something that doesn't belong to us? Well, once we said that, no one would work with either of us. Which was hard at first, because we have very different ways of working. My approach to detecting is a very passive one, very supine. Statistics don't lie. 90% of the time, the perp will come to you on their hands and knees and convict themselves. I find it's best to just sit back and let human nature take its course. Spoink has a different methodology. While Hogman's asleep in the back seat, I'm in the pilot seat firing missiles. They say a detective has to stay two steps ahead, while I like to stay 10 steps ahead around the corner hailing a cab. To this day, I hold the record for most arrests in a 12 month span 232. 200 of those arrests weren't even classifiable as crimes. Talking during a preview is not a crime. Jumping the queue for the Squidrus Alba is not a crime. Also, don't arrest someone when you're off duty at a water park in a G-string. It was hard work, but that's what it takes to make detective around here. They don't just hand that rank out to anyone. You have to earn it. Yeah, they were just asking if any male constables wanted to be a detective, and I guess I put my hand up and now here I am. Spoink and Hogman were promoted to homicide and partnered together to keep them away from crime because they're both better at committing it than they are at solving it. We get one murder in this state a year, if we're lucky. And even then, we already know who did it. The killer either gets dobbed in, caught on camera, stays on the scene, or suicides. So the likelihood of these two nitwits landing an actual murder investigation was comically remote. <sighs> Life is cruel. Somehow, the press got full access to the crime scene. <laughs> and of course, we copped the blame. Hey, are you the crime scene photographer? Um, yes. Great. Come take a photo of the three of us, but just for our records, okay? <laughs> you see that fist-shaped indentation in the wall behind me? That was from the night that article popped up on my feed. From that point, the entire nation was looking at us with an expression of abject disgust. I think it became known as the stupid cop meme. And you still see it today. Every time a police officer makes a mistake, shoots the wrong kid and the story reaches Twitter, someone always posts that image of us grinning like fuckwits. I 
wanted to hang them from the top of the Q1 building. What I did instead was call them at the scene to make sure that there was no misunderstanding. They had exactly 48 hours to bring me the killer and enough evidence to send that killer to Azkaban. Or the only cases they'd ever get to handle would be on the tarmac at the Gold Coast Airport. If I lost this job, I'd be all right. I'm like that last drop of urine. I always land on my feet. But Edie, of uh, Detective Spoink, this is a whole life. Since she was a kid, being a detective is her dream. Plus she rents a tiny apartment, lives small paycheck to small paycheck. There's nothing and no one to fall back on. No safety net if she slips off the trapeze. We had to solve this case and keep our jobs for her sake. I was afraid for math. Uh, Detective Hogman. His wife is his rock, but if he lost this job, she'd sever that chain for good. I mean, he's always welcome to crash on my fold out. But if we're both out of a job, then I'm out of an apartment. And then where's he gonna go? He's got nothing. No one. No parachute to catch him if he falls off the skyscraper. We had to solve this case and keep our jobs for his sake. We searched the house top to bottom, no murder weapon, which lent a lot of credence to the intruder theory. But then we found something by the side fence that flipped everything on its nut. Sweet child of mine. Edie, check this out. Gilbert Ashell is taken to the station for immediate cavity search and questioning. We found the semen, Gilbert. What semen? Your semen. In the bed, right next to your wife's corpse. But it, it, it's our bed and I don't think we've cleaned the sheets in about a month. Are you saying that at some point in the last month, you had sex with your own wife in your own bed? Yes. Okay, maybe I'm bringing too much of my own experiences to this, but that sounds totally absurd. Okay, maybe that explains the semen. But our team also found traces of your wife's blood on your clothing. What, this? Uh, well, uh, when I walked in and, and saw her, I, I, I wasn't thinking. I just ran to the bed and embraced her in, in a desperate panic. Forensics reckons the spatter pattern is the result of spray as opposed to direct contact. But that could be a typo. You know what? I was quite delirious from grief. I'm, I may have tried to splash myself in the face to clear my head. With your wife's blood? Well, that's what was on hand. Gilbert, have you seen this note before? No. What, where, where did you find that? Well, it seems someone dropped it over your side fence while we were searching the house. No fingerprints. We canvassed all the neighbours. No one claimed authorship. We had a mystery eyewitness out there who, for whatever reason, was afraid to come forward and afraid to offer any specifics. You mean someone saw what happened? Well, we can't say that for sure, but yes, definitely. We're trying to track them down. Uh, I'd like to help. I could talk to my neighbours. No, no, no. You let us handle that, Gilbert. Give yourself time to mourn. At this moment, something unusual occurs. Detective Spoink is called to the door by someone claiming to know Mr. Ashell. Someone named Bambi is asking for you? Ah, uh, that's our North American au pair. I called her after I called the police. She's here to pick up my kids. Unless we're done here. I'll tell her to give us a minute. You son of a bitch! You told me that you'd leave her, not that you'd make her leave this mortal plane! Woo! What was that? The strawberry blast. Can someone stop her leaving, please? But tell her she's gonna pay for my shirt! Turns out Gilbert Shell was having an affair with a woman 22 40 fifths his age. And they call us pigs. Very impressive pull by my mate Gilbo. Very impressive. <laughs> I knew I should have been a poetry professor. Thanks, Mum. 
In the next episode of Untrue Crime, Spoink and Hogman strip Gilbert's babysitter with benefits down to her bare, naked soul. It's just one name, like Zendaya. And who really was Deborah Ashell, really? Her grieving family come forward to strip her down to her bare, naked soul.